We believe in the substitutionary atoning death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So goes the statements of belief that we're going to talk about this week. I'm going to extend it slightly and talk about penal substitutionary atonement, which is another way of defining it. And we're going to take each of those words and talk about them. So first of all, let's get straight into it and talk about penal. The word penal or penalty or punishment. And the Bible's clear that all the way through that sin or rebellion against God's glory or disobedience of God's command will result in punishment. If you eat of the tree, Adam is told, um, the, the forbidden tree in the centre of a garden, you will surely die, Genesis 2, 17. The themes and the stories of the Old Testament, such as Cain and Abel, the story of Noah and the flood, the wanderings in the desert, all affirm this concept and link um, sin and disobedience of God's command to, to punishment. The Mosaic law, we, you will read in Deuteronomy 28 that there are blessings for obedience and the curses of disobedience. Ezekiel 18, 20, the soul will sins will die, that sins will die. And again, in the New Testament, Romans 6, 23, a famous verse, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we will find many uh, themes and many verses, many stories about um, that connection so sin is punished according to the bible and that is clear that the penalty of sin is death sin is an offense to god the bible tells us it besmirches his glory it's a challenge to his holiness it's a challenge to his being his essence and god acts decisively to eradicate sin to destroy it the earth is the lord's and everything in it we read in Psalms, well, it's God's prerogative, it's God's earth and God's world and God has created the world to reflect his glory and sin um, ultimately has no part of that. Sin's penalty, I want to say just before moving on to the next word, is, is not just a consequence of sin. And, and although it, it is true that sin ultimately destroys us and we can, and we can see that, naturally in our world and all around us if i drive dangerously and stupidly ultimately i might die or i might cause the death of another if i abuse my body with drugs or harmful substances the outcome won't be good in the end so sin it's sin the sin's penalty is not just a consequence though nor is it just a removal of sin and it, it, it's but although that is true too god acts to eradicate the cancer of sin he commit but, but surgery to, to remove it painful surgery sometimes god acts to destroy it and to remove it from his world and i want to also say not nor is it just a rep a reparation a balancing the books a resurrection and all these aspects are important all these fit together in the whole picture uh, and, and are amazing pieces of our understanding of god's redemptive Story. But sin, as we've said, is an offence to God. Sin's, sin's penalty is a punishment meted out by God, a fulfilment of his justice, a satisfaction of his wrath. I'd like to talk also about the word atonement. So I'm going to penal substitutionary atonement. I'm just going to switch it round about, uh, round a little, talk about atonement. Uh, and, and if we want a definition of what atonement is, Dr. Petsch uses um, and gives us at one meant, which he says is an old Anglo-Saxon term. And so atonement means to bring together as one, to unite. Um, if you look in your Google dictionary, as I have done, you'll often see terms like reparation or to make amends. And if we explore that a little bit further, we, we, we understand reparation in the context maybe of nations and the way nations interact with one another so for example following the second world war germany had to pay reparations to the allies to compensate for the for the vast losses that um, the, the warring nations has made the allies had made and germany was responsible in a to a large degree for those losses we we hear it raised today in discussions about the historic um, slave trade and that nations who were responsible and complicit in those acts should compensate those nations that suffered and peoples that were the victims so that's what reparation means um, and, and, but we've already touched on the fact that the penalty for sin is death 
So when we consider atonement, uh, reparation for sin, then we must consider death and the biblical views of atonement that involve sacrifice. Uh, and, and again, we'll find that that's a major biblical theme. So going back to Adam and Eve again, when they sinned, their nakedness was covered by animal skin, an animal that had to die, an animal that had to shed blood in order that Adam and Eve's shame could be covered. There's the almost terrible story that we find in Genesis of Abraham raising a knife to his own son, Isaac, before God intervenes and provides a ram in the thicket, which uh, are speaking of this subject of sacrifice uh, in the Bible. The temple, the whole sacrificial system um, that was um, legalised and documented uh, uh, in the laws delivered to Moses all speak of a, sacri a sacrifice and that uh, an animal must be sacrificed uh, in place uh, of people's sin to, to uh, atone for people's sin. Isaiah 53, we have that great scripture, Jesus, uh, speaking of Jesus, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, he says. Mark 10, 25, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So this concept of atonement, this concept of sacrifice um, for sin is present in a big way in our Bible. A key verse is found in Romans 3 and 25, which says, whom God set forth as a propitiation through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. And propitiation is an important word in our understanding of atonement. It means to turn aside, to appease God's wrath towards sin and sinners. Some might find, and some do find, that this concept is unacceptable, that God is not angry, and that to consider that God directed his wrath against his own son is abhorrent, irreconcilable with the concept of God's love, and they therefore might promote other meanings to the cross or what the, what the cross meant. So some of the examples of this is that Jesus absorbed the consequences of sin. So if, death's conse if sin's consequence is death, then Jesus took death upon himself. If sin's consequence is suffering, then Jesus suffered and he absorbed and therefore neutralised sin in some way. Or that Jesus' death, another um, pr promotion is that um, Jesus' death on the cross was an example to us to show us how to respond to the sin and violence that's in our world. Or again, a slight variation to somehow suggest that Jesus' death, Jesus offered his death as a sacrifice to demonstrate straight in a representative manner that mankind is truly truly sorry truly it was the ultimate act of repentance the ultimate act of, of sacrifice to show god that there, there was a they were truly sorry for this for the sin and therefore sin could be removed sin could be taken off the table and each of these views might have some value but i believe that we misunderstand the awfulness the seriousness of our sin that separates us from god if we do not maintain the concept of jesus death being a propitiation from sin and then finally we look at the word substitution um, and i guess most of us will know a substitute is one who takes a place of another jesus was the holy one of god he was sinless at birth born supernaturally born of a virgin so no um, no concepts and no, no imputing of original sin in Jesus' birth. Jesus was sinless throughout his life and therefore was the only person who was not deserving of the penalty of sin. In fact, the opposite is true. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, is what God the Father said at Jesus' baptism. And then this perfect man then offers himself as a sacrifice in place of the guilty ones those guilty ones who indeed should have been punished. This is my body broken for you, Jesus said. My blood shed for you. These are his words as he reorientates the Jewish Passover feast and, and the ritual around his own death. Perhaps if it weren't for this aspect, then it might be difficult to understand how a loving God could allow his own son to die. But it's this concept of substitution that shows us that God... Um, allowed his own son to die that jesus was willing to go to death because he loved us because he loved um, his creation so much and that's what romans 5 and verse 8 says god demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners christ died for us 
and, and in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 19, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And another great verse in 1 John 4 verse 10, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice or a propitiation for our sins. God loves us, friends. And we see this most, I believe, in his substitutionary atoning death. He died in our place, bearing the punishment of our guilt, clothing us in his righteousness, that we might stand before God, forgiven and cleansed of all unrighteousness, and to participate in the glorious reward earned on our behalf by our Saviour, Jesus. Finishing with 1 Peter 1 verse 4, because it should bring about praise in our hearts that God loves us so much that he died for us. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade.